everyone. Good afternoon. It's my pleasure to introduce our author for this afternoon, Jonathan Goshel. He writes at the intersection of science, art, and literature. And most recently, he even put his body on the line for the book, The Professor in the Cage, Why Men Like to Fight and Why We Like to Watch. He's the author of six additional books, The Storytelling Animal, How Stories Make Us Human, which draws on the latest research in neuroscientists, psychology, and biology to show how storytelling has evolved as a fundamental human instinct. His, his more, he has more books, just some of them are The Rape of Troy, Evolution, Violence, and the, world, and the World of Homer and Literature, and the New Humanities. Jonathan also teaches in the English department at Washington and Jefferson College in Pennsylvania, and blogs about the mysteries of storytelling at Psychology Today. His work has been featured in the New York Times, the Scientific American, the New York of the Atlantic, and NPR. Um, I'd love to welcome him to the stage. He's had a few operations, um, so and he's fighting fit, so hopefully he'll tell us about this amazing journey um, through yeah, male fighting. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. He's out of the way here. Where are we at? Nice to see you guys. How awesome it is to be at this festival. So. Uh, Lucky and proud uh, to be invited here. Um, a few years ago, I'm standing in this uh, chain link cage. My wife's looking at me in a weird way. What's wrong? Did I fly down? She's giving me that wifely look that makes me feel like uh, something is going disastrously wrong. Um, <laughs> was it pride? This is my husband up there. What a man. What a woman I must be. Um, so a few years ago, I'm standing half naked in this chain link cage. Um, I'm dancing around from foot to bare foot. I'm trying to clear this anxiety that's building up my, in my chest because I can see this young man coming through the crowd. And he's coming to break my face. He's coming to strangle me to sleep. It's like a nightmare. I'm almost 40 years old, a few months short shy of my 40th birthday. Uh, I wrote my first book about the science of violence but I've never experienced real violence before. I've never even been in an actual fight. But that is about to change. I watch them smear Vaseline on the young man's face so my punches will slide on his face and not bite. I watch them put a mouthpiece between his lips. I watch them and see that he's making fists in his fingerless gloves and I can hear my own Gloves creaking as I do the same thing. People have the wrong idea about the gloves. <laughs> People have the wrong idea. They think they civilized the sport, but they are the very soul of the sport's barbarism. The fine, thin uh, bones of the hand, these are no match for the heavy skull. You throw punches, fists shatter on heads. But if you take this fragile tool, and you, wipe, you wrap it up tight in ribbons of gauze and ribbons of tape, and then you encase the whole thing in, ar in uh, an armor of foam and leather. You turn this fragile tool into a brutally powerful cudgel that men can throw around with wild abandon. What the glove does is it weaponizes the hand. The young man comes into the cage, I hear them slide the bolt shut, and they're locking us in to fight until one of us can. The referee moves to center cage. He says to us, fighter, are you ready? And we both nod. And in that next moment, the next heartbeat, civilization is going to melt away. The law will just disappear. And we are going to meet at the center of the cage, and we're going to try to kill each other. And I've never seen this young man before. And I feel nothing for him except respect. And yet the crowd is going to cheer as I try to shut down his brain with punches, as I try to wrench his joints and throttle his neck until his eyes roll blindly. The referee, he yells, fight. And so we do. This was the culmination of a journey that began a couple years earlier. I'm working as an adjunct English 
professor at a small liberal arts college, and I'm sitting in my cubicle, sort of mulling the disappointments of my academic career. Uh, I had a PhD, my name was on the cover of a few books. I'd already kind of experienced my 15 minutes of fame, or at least kind of what passes for fame among academic types. Um, but I was still a lowly adjunct. I was making Walmart wages, teaching freshman composition over and over and over again to students who really could care less. Uh, my, for reasons that are kind of too boring to go into, my academic career was sort of dead in the water. And the question then for me was, what was I going to do? Did I have the courage to move on to something new? And if I didn't even have that courage, maybe at least I had the courage to provoke my bosses enough into firing me. And one day I'm in my cubicle and I happen to look out uh, the front window. I saw this sort of streak of motion. And there used to be a, a business across the street. It was an auto parts store. And the auto parts store went out of business. But now, this is, by the way, about as far away as you know, one corner of this room to the other corner. I could throw a snowball and hit this building. Um, now this new product was being displayed through these big picture windows. It was a chain link cage, and there's these two young men in the chain link cage, and they're dancing, and they're hitting, and they're tackling, and they're rolling, and they're getting up to dance some more. And I watched it for a long time, and I was ambushed by this powerful and really, truly unexpected emotion, and the emotion was envy. I envied those young guys. They seem so alive, they seem so brave in their cage, while I feel like I'm rotting away timidly inside my cage. And so I started to fantasize. And at first it was sort of a, a joke, almost at my own expense. Wouldn't it be funny if I went across the street and joined them? Me, you know, I'm a college professor, I've never been in a fight. But the very thought of it made me smile. It made me smile because I could imagine my colleagues looking up from their volume of poetry, and there I'd be across the street, warring <laughs> in the cage. And I thought to myself, it would be such a scandal. And I said to myself, that's how I'll do it. That's how I will get myself fired. <laughs> I rush home. I tell my wife. This is my wife here. It's not actually my wife. If you type, if you type skeptical wife into Google Images, uh, this is the woman uh, that appears. I rush home. I tell my wife my whole you know, dumb plan for becoming a cage fighter and ruining my academic career. And she says, uh, why would you want to do that? You have no skills. You will be killed. And it hurts to learn that your wife has no respect for your skills. It really does. But it hurt even worse to learn how casually she would learn to treat my danger. So a few years later, when, not two years later, maybe uh, a year later, when I'm having a lot of trouble lining up a fight in Pennsylvania where I live, she says, oh, why don't you go to Vegas and fight? My brother Anthony lives in Vegas. He's, yeah. Why don't you go to Vegas and fight? My brother Anthony lives in Vegas. He knows fighters. I bet he help, can help you get a fight. I said, honey, you don't understand. Vegas is the fight mecca of the entire universe. If I go there and fight, they will end my life, and they will send me home in buckets. And at this point, I'm hoping she'll kind of talk me out of the whole plan, but instead she just stares off into space like a prisoner who's dreaming of freedom, and she says, yeah, you should definitely fight in Vegas. <laughs> so, she asked a good question, though. Why do you want to do this? And I think there are multiple uh, answers to that question. There's always multiple answers to a question. Like, why did you write the book? There's always, a, there's always a, a, a suite of answers, a complex uh, of answers. One answer, though, was I had a legitimate scholarly interest in this. I've been studying violence for a long time. Uh, I had so little personal experience of violence, I thought it would be interesting and valuable to learn about it and to write about it from the inside. Okay? So that's one reason. The other reason was more personal. I'd always admired physical courage, but I'd never done a brave thing. Um, I wanted to fight, I think, for one of the oldest reasons that men have fought, which is to discover whether or not I was a coward. Uh, because isn't this true? This is the poet John Berryman. <coughs> so, you may not know much about this uh, cage fighting stuff, and so let me tell you a little bit about it. Let me tell you about it, though, by way of watching an actual fight. 
And in fact, in just a moment, we will watch the very first fight in the history of cage fighting. It happened in 1993. But first, a little bit of background. What's, what's cage fighting? About 20, again, about 22 years ago, 23 years ago, um, cage fighting originated as a way of settling these old, rambunctious barroom arguments between martial artists about who had the best style. So who would win a fight between a boxer and a wrestler, between a judo player and a karate fighter, between a kung fu master and a really mean, tough barroom brawler? All martial art styles claim to be the best, but how could you know? And the UFC, the Ultimate Fighting Championship, this is sort of the premier organization, the NFL of cage fighting, this was about putting up or shutting up. You took talented representatives, from each martial style, you literally locked them up in a cage for a fight that had no rules. With the idea being that the best style would prevail. So we're going to watch the very first fight in the history of this sport. The whole fight lasts 20 seconds. We're just going to watch the last 10. Okay? You may want to watch this uh, horror movie style uh, through, your, through, your, through your fingers if you're, if you're queasy about this sort of thing. And this fight certainly made me queasy uh, the first time I saw it. Um, the fight was, this is back in the very, very early days of the UFC. There's no weight classes. So this is a 400-pound sumo wrestler. who's very athletic, actually, for a man his size, against a 200-pound karate fighter. First 10 seconds of the fight, they've just been sort of circling each other, sizing each other up. And then the sumo wrestler charges. <laughs> Sumo gets up, he walks out of the cage, drooling blood, uh, he's lost both of his front teeth. Karate doesn't walk out of the cage, he limps out of the cage. Why does he limp out of the cage? Both of those front teeth are broken off inside of his foot. I'm telling you about this because I'm not trying to, I don't want to disguise what this stuff is. Um, cage fighting has changed a lot over the last 20 years. It's evolved. There's weight classes now. There's rounds. There's a lot more rules. It's a bit safer than it was. It's a bit more civilized. But it is still a deeply primitive sport, and it is primitive by design. Again, if you haven't seen a lot of this, if you just imagine it as a game of one-on-one -on -one tackle football, with all the roughness that that would include. But with the addition, tackle football with the addition of punching and kneeing and kicking and elbowing and joint locks and strangling. So it is rough stuff. And when I first, so when I first crossed the street from the English department to the fighting cage, I had certain ideas about it. And I expected to write a book, a sort of muckraking, journalistic expose almost, about the rise of mixed martial arts, is what it's, it's the, the, the sport's name, mixed martial arts or cage fighting, uh, about the rise of mixed martial arts in America, and what it says about us, not just as a nation, but even more particularly as a species. I saw cage fighting as this perfect metaphor for something really dark and nasty and rotten at the human core. I thought it was bad for society, I thought it was bad for the people who did it. Um, I thought it was, in the words of Joyce Carol Oates, Joyce Carol Oates said this of boxing, the very image, she said, quote, of man's ongoing historical madness. But working on the book actually kind of flipped my thinking. My library research convinced me that this sport tells us nothing particularly interesting about our place and time. Everywhere in the world, across cultures, across centuries, people have loved to watch men fight. And my gym research, training and sparring and interviewing the other, the other fighters and eventually fighting myself, sort of upended all my other preconceptions. So I set out to write this book about the darkness in men, and I ended up writing a book about how people, men in particular, keep that darkness in check. And to give you a sense of what I'm talking about, 
I want to tell you a story. And this is a story you only think that you know. It's uh, the fall of 1801, and Hamilton and his second and his surgeon ease themselves aboard this wobbly dinghy. And they have themselves rowed away from Manhattan and its laws against dueling to the Jersey side of the Hudson River. Once there, Hamilton tromps through the woods. He goes into this clearing where his adversary is already there. His adversary is there clearing away branches, pacing off the distance. What's the distance? Let's pace it off. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So from here to the end of that stage, that's the distance, about 30 feet. And Hamilton, this is his first duel. He cannot believe how close they're standing. They have 54 caliber balls aimed at each other's bodies. And we don't know for sure, uh, but probably they arranged themselves in classic dueling postures that were designed to shield the vital organs and shrink the profile. They probably would have stood sideways to each other. They would have cramped their necks to their chests and turned like this to guard the neck. They would have turned the hip like this in hopes of taking a low shot in the buttock and not the groin. And when the call came to fire, they wouldn't have fired like this. That exposes too much. They would have fired like this. Everything's all cramped up so the arm and the, the pistol can shield the vital organs. So they stand there like that, waiting. And when the call to fire comes, neither man does. They just stand there forever, uh, waiting. They seem to both be waiting that someone is going to come to their senses. And they're going to call this madness off, and they can embrace and part as friends, or at least shake hands. That was part of the code duellum. Once it was done, it was done. You shook hands, you hugged, you, you hugged it out, and you, and, and, you, uh, and, you, and you buried it. Nothing happens, though. So I, a, a little after a minute, almost a minute passes, which must have been forever, you know, in that clearing. Um, and Hamilton finally raises his gun. And there's two near simultaneous explosions. The balls pass each other in flight. One goes sizzling off wide into the woods, and the other steers around Hamilton's gun arm and punches a fist-sized hole through his innards. He falls face first to the earth. He's rowed back to Manhattan, and he spends the next 24 hours writhing in agony, trying to die bravely. And now we get to the part of the story maybe you didn't know. When Hamilton's father hears the news of this catastrophe, he rushes to his son's bedside. The father was this man, Alexander Hamilton, the Secretary of the Treasury, former Secretary of the Treasury, the man whose face is still on the $10 bill, and he climbs carefully into bed with his 19-year-old son, Philip, there he is. You can see they have the same nose. He holds him, and he gives vent to his grief. It's a pathetic scene. One of uh, Philip's friends says that Alexander's grief, quote, beggared all description. And when the boy is buried, Alexander can't even walk to the graveside. Another friend of Alexander says that Alexander had to be, quote, half carried to the grave of his hopes. And yet, three years later, and knowing he's in the wrong, Hamilton has himself rowed from Manhattan and his laws against dueling to the Jersey Shore side of the Hudson River, where Aaron Burr, the sitting vice president of the United States, is waiting to cut him down. Hamilton is gut shot, just like his son, and his agonies last for 38 hours. And according to his surgeon, they are not much deadened by opium. He's in, he's in terrible, uh, unendurable agony, uh, according to his surgeon. So this is a very sad story, and it's a very uh, tragic story. It's tragic because of its waste. Um, they weren't fighting over anything that mattered. They both died over nothing. Alexander died, basically, there's a long thing going back between Hamilton and, 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 and Burr, but the straw that broke the camel's back was basically profane, probably semi-drunken uh, table gossip. 
um, with his son. It was even worse. His son basically died over a schoolyard insult. A man called him a rascal, and the man would not take it back. Yeah. Rascal it sounds like nothing to us. But it was actually those were fighting words. Fighting words means that there were certain code words that you used specifically to provoke a gunfight. You could call somebody a jackanapes, <laughs> you could call them a liar, you call them a, uh, a rascal, and it was, it was code for, would you like to meet me for a gunfight? So uh, this seems deranged, fighting these deadly duels over slights and gossip over nothing, uh, but we should avoid falling for a, a narrative that is self-flattering and paints us as the enlightened ones. We have to remember that the duel emerges in Europe about 500 years ago, this formal, high, aristocratic duel, about 500 years ago in Europe, when the state was weak, and men were largely responsible for getting their own justice. The duel does not emerge as a way to give free reign to savagery, not at all. It was about locking savagery up in rules and codes and, uh, that were as clear and as fair and as tight as the rules of tennis. The duel is this whole system of conflict resolution, including back and forth between your seconds, between uh, intermediaries who are supposed to be cool-headed. And most times, it managed to avert real bloodshed. And even when it comes to real bloodshed, if you look back through the statistics, most people manage to walk away or limp away from their duels afterwards. Okay, so what am I talking about this, the, so much about the duel for? Um, the point is that this, I'm not meaning to glorify the duel, but the point is this is what my book ended up being about. It ended up being about the duels of men broadly defined. These systems and ways that men have developed to minimize and manage the worst harms of male aggression, and male competition. Uh, let me give you uh, a bit of a sense for this. Historians usually start their histories of the duel about 500 years ago in Europe. I'm arguing that's about a, that's millions of years too late. Not only is the duel not a European thing, it happens all around the world in, in different forms. It's not even a strictly human thing. Animals have their fights too. They have their, their duels as well. A biologist often call them duels. And if you've ever seen uh, a nature video of a couple of elephant seals clashing in the surf or a couple of mountain goats cracking skulls on a hillside, you know what I'm talking about. Biologists call this ritual combat. It's a means that exists in this startlingly diverse array of species where animals have developed ways of figuring out who is bigger, who is stronger, who's tougher, who's fitter, who's faster without the dangers of fighting it out to the bitter death and people are animals too. We're complicated animals, we're cultured animals, but we're animals still. We're mammals, we're primates, we're great apes and humans, especially the males, are, are masters of something that I call the monkey dance. Which is this dizzying variety of ritualized, rule-bound competitions. Everything from formal duels uh, to uh, verbal duels, like this rap battle uh, right here, to the play fights of boys, to sports, uh, which I see, uh, along with some biologists and psychologists, as a signature human form of ritual combat. We evolve to be such a sporty animal, because sports are useful. They allow us to figure out, again, bigger, tougher, fitter, faster, more perseverant, harder working, tougher, uh, without the dangers of figuring it out in actual violence, and without the social chaos that comes with that. In sports, you can fight it out, and you can fight it out hard, and you can still stay friends at the end. But maybe you're wondering, uh, why did I subtitle my book, particularly why men fight and why we like to watch? Why all this emphasis on men when this woman Ronda Rousey, the glorious and the great Ronda Rousey, is arguably the most famous uh, fighter on the planet, and up to uh, a couple months ago, the most dominant. Um, uh, there is attention to, to women uh, in, in the book, but the focus is on men, and it's for a simple reason. It's a book about violence, and the story of human violence everywhere in the world, everywhere that historians have 
studied, everywhere that anthropologists have visited, is overwhelmingly a story of men. Women appear in these stories, but they appear as bit players and they appear as victims. And this history of male violence has shaped the species. This is why men are bigger than women. It's why men are stronger than women. It's why men are faster than women. It's why even in trained athletes, men have substantially higher cardiovascular capacity. And I believe, along again with some biologists and psychologists, that it's also affected our minds and our brains and our behaviors. This is why, in general, with all exceptions and outliers granted, men are more aggressive than women. It's why men, again, all around the world, without exception, are way more prone to taking truly idiotic risks, like having gunfights over somebody calling you a rascal. And it is why men are, again, all over the world, without exception, in the history of the planet, as far as we know, much, much, much more likely to resort to physical forms of violence. And I actually think, this is a somewhat politically incorrect argument uh, in some circles, but I actually think it's very important that we recognize this and we face it. Because as a species, we need for men to behave themselves better. It's really important. And we need them to curb their you know, tendencies toward aggression. And we can't hope to set up conditions where that happen if we won't honestly admit where those tendencies are coming from. Um, how am I doing time-wise? Am I 30 minutes in already? Yes. you got to be kidding me. I'm going to have to skip a slide or two here. Uh, the subtitle of the book is Why Men Fight and Why We Like to Watch. I'm going to skip the Why We Like to Watch part. It's actually the first time I've spoken in a, for, for a formal talk about this, so my timing is not very good. Um, our conference theme is uh, Heroes and Protagonists. And here's the hero of our story. <laughs> this boy. Oh, yeah. He looks like he's about 9, 10 years old. He's actually about 15 years old. He weighs about 100 pounds. <laughs> Now, take a look at this boy and be honest. Is your, is your neck getting a little hot, a little sweaty, a little prickly? Is your eyebrow starting to twitch? You feel your fists balling up at your sides? Are you thinking to yourself, I'd really like to slug that a little? <laughs> if you do feel that way, don't feel too bad about yourself. The boy have that effect on a lot of people. And the truth is that when the rough lads close in around this boy, he did not always behave himself, acquit himself in an honorable and stalwart fashion. But the boy grew up, he grew stronger, he married a stone fox, as you can see. <laughs> he sired pretty children, did some good work. But he always marveled that the shame of those teenage years has stayed with him. So much so that he can only talk about it now in the third person. And so I took up cage fighting at 40, at least in part, to redeem this boy for the times he'd flinched. I never wanted to hurt anyone. I never once fantasized about pe beating people up. That was not part of it for me. To the contrary, I wanted to use fighting to attack and destroy a certain weakness and timidity inside me that I had always despised. I wanted to see if it was possible for a man who didn't seem to be naturally endowed with bravery to go into a scary situation night after night and practice being brave until it became habitual. Can, can bravery actually be a, a kind of skill? So I go to the gym. The guys are nice guys. They're not the high school bully types I expected. They're kind of shockingly ordinary, decent young fellows. Um, and I trained hard, and I trained hard uh, for a variety of reasons, but the main one was I never thought I could get really good at this um, in, in the time that I had, but I hoped to get good enough not to die. Uh, cage fighting is pretty dangerous, and I, I, I needed to have some basic, I needed to be fit enough, I needed to be strong enough, and I needed to be skilled enough to survive, uh, more or less. Uh, the other guys, as I said, were nice guys, but they still choked me a lot, <laughs> and they still punched me a lot. And now and then, they sent me to the hospital. And now and then, though I got 
them back. And on those nights when, the, when I had uh, held my own in the sparring, I would feel great. I'd feel tall. I'd feel brave. I'd drive home and I'd feel this sort of, I'd, I'd realize I'd been going through my life sort of half asleep and I felt this sort of euphoric uh, gratitude for my body, my, my, my bone, my blood. Uh, but more often, I felt exactly like my nine-year-old daughter had drawn me in her masterpiece titled Daddy at Wrestling. I felt like this guy. I felt old. I felt haunted. And I felt afraid. I felt a lot like this guy. You guess you didn't see the resemblance there? And what was I afraid of? I, I was afraid of all the things. I was afraid of concussion. I was afraid of like messing up my brain. I was afraid of tearing my knee. I was afraid of all kinds of stuff. But I was mainly afraid of fear. I was mainly afraid of fear itself. I was afraid that uh, in the final moment, I would find, I was chicken out. I, I'd find some excuse not to fight. I'd, I wouldn't be able to climb the steps to the cage. Uh, whatever. Maybe when the fight started, I'd just run in circles around the cage, uh, fleeing from my life. Um, so after 15 months, so the big fight uh, arrives, and I've struggled with what I should say about this to you guys because the writer in me says, "Don't tell them anything. <laughs> Protect the ending. Don't spoil it." But the but the sort of the on stage storyteller says, "Not ah, tell everything." So I want to sort of split the difference. Um, there, there's actually two big fights that the, that the book builds towards. One is this one. I'm going to tell you about that one. The other fight was a, a sort of um, I wasn't getting fired from my job. And so I intensified my efforts. And there was a faculty party where I had a fight with an assistant chemistry professor. And a, he's a, like a third degree black belt. It was not an angry fight. It was completely amicable. It's sort of a sparring contest where the whole English department gathers around uh, to watch. Um, but it was very educational. And that's the actual climax uh, to the book, that fight. So I'll tell you about this one. Um, going into the fight, we didn't know my coach and I, we didn't know anything about this young man. We didn't know if he was a boxer or a wrestler. We didn't know if he was a lefty or a righty. These are really bad things not to know going into a fight. But at the amateur level, it's often this way. There's no film on these people. But we did know a lot about me, and we knew I was a lot more comfortable in the grappling component. I was a lot more comfortable fighting on the ground than I was on my, on my feet. So the game plan was very simple. We're gonna go into the fight, we're gonna put him on the ground, and we're gonna make him fight me off his back. All right, so the bell rings. He says, he says fight, and so we do. The bell rings, I immediately throw a jab, just enough to make him flinch, duck down, get a leg, and tap him up against the fence. Things are going wonderfully. About 10 seconds into the fight, I've moved into this position. The, the photograph doesn't quite capture it, but you can see I'm moving, I'm the guy on top, you see I'm moving towards something called the mount. The mount is, um, uh, all these are basically, it's, all the moves are basically out of the Kama Sutra. There's a, there's this, they're, all, they're, they're all sexual positions. There's missionary, there's girl on top, there's, there's a, uh, so this is uh, me on top, I'm, I'm going to be straddling his waist. It's the most dominant position in a fight where I can punch him, I can look for submissions. Um, that's about 10 seconds in. Things are going wonderfully. In about 10.1 seconds, things begin to change. Uh, he gets a hold of my arm. He twists underneath me. He begins to walk up the fence with his feet, really niftily. And this is where it leaves us. Now, it may look like I'm in charge there because I'm on top, but I'm not. Uh, he is in charge there. What he's locking up there is something called an arm bar. And you may not know what an arm bar is. If you don't know what an arm bar is, I hired these two babies to demonstrate. <laughs> so a baby on the right in the blue shorts, he's the boss. And you can see how he has isolated this arm. He's going to pull down the wrist hard while thrusting up with the pelvis, hyperextending the elbow. Uh, if he pulls hard enough, this baby will dislocate and destroy the other baby's joint. The baby, however, you'll notice, is tapping out the little white, the little white so, so the little baby is, the other baby is surrendering, so it's all going to be okay. So I can feel this happening, and I know enough, you know, I know enough about 15 months in my training, I know enough to know this is bad. And so I get up, and I, as you can see, I got on my feet, and I start yanking, yanking, yanking to, to, to free that arm. And I get away, and I backpedal across the cage, he rolls to his feet, he comes after me. And then comes the moment 
that would haunt me for months afterwards. Uh, losing a fight, losing a fight is not like losing at ping pong. It is not like losing at basketball. It is much more psychologically and emotionally consequential. <laughs> this is the moment that would haunt me. Uh, he comes across the cage, uh, and, I, and the thought that I would think every night before bed and when I got up in the morning was, what if I hadn't been so stupid? What if I uh, had noticed from the skill of his ground maneuvers that rolling around on the ground with this guy was a bad idea? But the fight was going so fast, and my mind was a total blank. I had no higher processing ability. And so when he comes after me, I just set a classic ground fighter's ambush. When a man's going to throw a punch or a kick, it usually begins with a tell, like a poker tell. And the tell is simply a little twitch. It's a little convulsion that comes in the hips or it comes in the shoulders. And as soon as you see that twitch, you just sit there and you wait and you wait for that twitch. As soon as you see it, you drop levels and you shoot in uh, for a takedown. I do that. On the way in, you can see he's throwing a kick. He kicks me pretty hard uh, in the ribs. But then my shoulder hits his belly. I yank at his legs. He's airborne and I drive him hard to the mat. And it's one of the Maybe, maybe the best thing I've yet accomplished uh, in my life, uh, this moment. And I know it at the time, I'm like, boy, that was great, because the crowd was crazy, it was loud when he hits the mat. And I'm sort of on top, and I'm in charge, and I'm thinking to myself, well, you know, I, I guess i got to punch him now. <laughs> but I never got a chance to, because the next moment was deeply confusing. The room begins to spin, the ceiling comes down, it slides under the mat and I'm about to sustain a crippling arm injury. He manages to flip me over using his spooky ninja abilities, and he's got me in that arm bar again. And there is no way to gut through, there's no way to uh, wiggle my way out. Uh, the choice is pretty simple. I can feel all those muscles in my arm stretching out, I can feel the joint, the cartilage, the tendons, everything is poised to pop. And the choice is simple. It's like have your arm ruined or, or beg for a quarter. And I begged for a quarter. I surrendered. Uh, as you can see, I'm in the act of tapping out. That's an emotionally consequential moment. Let me tell you why. That's sign language. That is MMA sign language. It says, I surrender. It, it means uncle. But it also means something like this. Please stop. Please stop. I acknowledge you are the better man. I acknowledge that you could kill me right now with your bare hands if you wanted to. This is when referees stop fights, when one man could kill the other man with only token resistance. And he would do it by breaking that arm very easily, and then he could finish me off however he wanted, by pounding or by jointing me like a chicken, you know, he could just take me apart. Um, so that's why it's such emotionally, it's a very primal thing that happens there. A man has shown in front of a big audience, in front of your wife, in front of your friends from the gym, that he could have killed you. To kill you. And there it is, the agony, the agony of defeat. Going into this fight, I didn't need, I didn't feel, I never, I, you know, I knew I might lose. I knew I, I knew I'd probably lose. I knew this was a, probably a suicide mission. But and I didn't feel like I needed to win to succeed. But if I lost, I felt like I had to lose bravely. That was my only criterion of victory. But I didn't know if I had lost bravely. Went back to the gym and I asked my friends, what was I thinking? Why did I, why did I shoot that second takedown? His grappling was obviously better than, why, why, why did I do that? And I'm like, dude, you're overthinking it. It was, your, it, was your first, it was your first fight. It's moving really fast. Let it go. No one loses, they said, if they had the courage to step into the cage. I said, okay, all right. But here's what I wanted to know. And I still don't know the answer to this question. Had I shot that second takedown because I preferred losing a relatively peaceful wrestling contest to trying to win a violent fist fight. I, I didn't know the answer to that question then, and I don't know the answer to that question now. After the fight, uh, I drove home, and I tried to sort of nail down 
all the things that I, I'd learned in this MMA adventure, and I concluded that I'd been wrong about the fighters and the fans. I expected the fans to be sort of voyeuristic ghouls. And they really weren't, and I, and I expected the fighters to be sort of twisted sadomasochists, you know, who enjoyed the, the pain, uh, the suffering, uh, and enjoyed dishing it out. They were not at all. They were, they were really good people. Uh, I, re I really liked them. And I came to see fighting at the end as a really good metaphor, not only for what's dark in men, but what's lovely in men, what's noble in, in men. Um, we're capable of great violence and brutality, but the sport really isn't about violence. The fighters are hitting each other, but they're hitting without anger in this atmosphere of mutual respect, mutual admiration, oftentimes mutual affection. And after the fight, a bond has been forged between them, this relationship that's based on a, a, an experience of great intensity. After my first uh, experience sparring at the gym heavily, a sort of heavy sparring, I wrote afterwards that uh, in my MMA diary that, that you know, nothing makes men love each other so much as a good-natured fist fight. And there is something about, it's, it's a very weird paradoxical thing. Um, so this is me with my new uh, friend. His name is Christopher McCloskey. And he's a small town boy from Altoona, Pennsylvania. He's 24 years old, he's engaged to be married. Uh, he's in school now, he wants to help people, care for people when he grows up. This is Christopher McCloskey, he's the man who kicked my ass and he is going to be a nurse when he grows up. So thank you, my, I think that's two minutes, okay I'm done, alright. Thank you for uh, listening to me, if you have any questions I'd be very happy to talk.